Welcome to Filmmaker U Live. Every week we go live with an industry professional to discuss their work. And this week I'm joined with Jim Ruxin, editor on The Apprentice, Celebrity Rehab with Dr. Drew, and Kitchen Nightmares. Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I guess I guess the elephant in the room question would be, um, what was it like to edit The Apprentice? Um, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> Ultimately, I'm glad I did it. Uh, mm -hmm. I was in on the first four seasons and I had been working for Mark Burnett on uh, several shows. I had done five others for him, five other seasons. And, uh, you know, there were some people who had worked on Survivor. Um, some worked on both. Uh, a lot of people came from Eco Challenge, which was a survivalist show. Mm -hmm. And it's a very experienced group of editors and the best takeaway was the other editors I worked with. I really learned a lot from them. It's a very collegial atmosphere where we shared our work. We talked about it in the hallways um, and uh, we saw each other's cuts. Uh, on The Apprentice, we'll stick to that. Um, we worked in team, four editorial teams and it consisted of a team leader and three other editors. And then there was, uh, so that's 16 people right there. There were three post supervisors there were uh, nine assistant editors, one or two of whom would do the, uh, the next up or uh, next week or the recaps. Um, and then there were two boardroom editors who focused only uh, on every other episode uh, in the boardroom only. A uh, boardroom had like m many more cameras than any other scene except maybe um, the uh, task announcement. Um, and uh, in the first three or four weeks of principal photography, there would be a team of 30 to 60 editors, uh, sorry, not editors, loggers and uh, transcribers. Uh, about half the show was, uh, half the footage was interview. Uh, it was averaging 200, 225 hours a show. 110 or so were either formal sit down interviews or OTFs on the flies where you grab somebody uh, in the heat of the moment and say, what, what are you thinking? What were you? What, what are you feeling? How are you reacting to this? And they were very effective, but they became less popular, I feel. And they hurt the show because, you know, it was much more interesting to see somebody talking in the scene where the action was happening or near it, rather than uh, a talking head in a more neutral environment that related less. And it wasn't as fresh in the moment. But what was it like? Well, there were also, oh, by the way, uh, so this post-production machine was like 80 or 90 people in the opening weeks. There were also teams of story producers and assistant story producers. The story producers uh, were all in the field during shooting and then returned when shooting was done. Um, and uh, they had an assistant story producer who would do string outs, which were miserable always, or find bites in the interview files. And they really were just functionary assistants in the beginning. They, they really didn't serve us very well. Um, and especially season one was very rough because nobody knew what we were doing yet. Uh, the format had not been invented in terms of uh, scenes, but basically this show was structured as task delivery where Trump shows up and delivers the task to all the teams. And I, we started out with, um, I believe uh, four teams of four, there, there might've been 18 players somehow in the first episode, first season and then it went down a little bit. Um, and uh, uh, also the task, uh, the main task of the show would have a sponsor, an organization, um, whether it was an airline or Mars candy bars or uh, uh, any number, I mean, you've all seen the show. So you know who the, the, the central task was. And uh, that would be a big event. All the teams would show up. Trump would show up in his limo, um, walk on the set, say, what do you want me to say? And uh, the cameras would be rolling. We had 15 cameras that day. Trump could not put a sentence together. And fortunately we had all the coverage, at least four of the cameras were on him exclusively. So we always had, we could cut to a different moment, uh, skip out his stammering, his backtracking. And we had cameras on all the contestants. So we always had cutaways. So the hard part of that scene was just making him sound coherent. Um, it wasn't for want of coverage. Uh, we didn't have to stick many words in his mouth. Um, and there were plenty of reactions. The entrances and the exits were kind of clumsy because it was a team of people there. Uh, it, we did one at the Toys R Us uh, on Times Square. 
you know, these are often big environments and, uh, you know, a little harder to control and to get nice shots at uh, from, but uh, a lot of effort was put into staging those scenes. Um, and uh, I should say that the story producers were in the field supervising that whole show. First season, uh, they shot for five days and uh, task delivery was on day one. Uh, then there was a mini task for uh, a privilege, which was probably day two. And then the main task, they had two days to do. And then the boardroom uh, was like, I shouldn't say just the boardroom because there was a very strategic scene where um, once the task was done, the camera stayed with the teams and uh, sort of covered the machinations of the teammates as they tried to decide who they wanted to throw off. They knew what team was going into the boardroom of teams and, um, uh, there, there was politicizing and alliances formed in, in these very critical scenes. They were very hard to edit because they took place all over the suite um, and uh, behind closed doors often. And uh, these alliances which began to form persisted or didn't persist. The most famous one was when uh, um, Kwame was thrown under the bus by that uh, wonderful person. I block her name out all the time because she was so despicable. Um, but she became part of Trump's team later on, uh, the Black Beauty Consultant. Uh, you all know who she is. And uh, she, she was very difficult to deal with because she was always cagey. Um, but uh, some of the examples of what to do on the first show was uh, they had done profiles of each of the 16 competitors, uh, interview in a pretty situation, letting them introduce themselves. Very cumbersome. I don't think we use them. Certainly stopped shooting them. Um, other aspects, sometimes a show would be overwritten and there'd be too many moving parts to it. Um, uh, I remember one show in particular, um, it was uh, for, for season as well. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, first season. Again, it was the, the Kwame, Omarosa was the wonderful woman um, where uh, they had to cast a composer, write a song with the composer, produce the song with the composer uh, do a focus group with an audience on the composer and then launch it on uh, a serious XM radio station. Well, the show is only 42 minutes long. It's a lot of scenes to cover. And uh, uh, a lot of those moving parts got cut out. And that was because the task, there was a whole committee, a task department, which would design these tasks and set, set, set them up. One, you know, the core would be the principal task, but you'd had to have a, the, the test assignment for privilege uh, set up. You'd have to clear all the locations. You'd have to structure it so it could be measured. Uh, often it was who raised, who sold how many dollars, like the chopped, uh, the, the uh, food truck race does now. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, there were just a lot of different segments, but they were standardized and would, would be slotted. It doesn't mean the show was easy to edit because after task delivery, the performance of the two tasks, the minor and the major task, was all freeform cinema verite, uh, you know, run and gun, let's follow these guys. Um, very little was set up, uh, maybe entrances and exits, or, but it was mostly you're on your own. Uh, in the beginning, we'd have more than, um, remember we start out with 15 cameras when the, t the teams would meet each other and the task delivery. But then when the teams divided up, you had to split your camera crew up as well. So you had at most four and that was very rare covering any one team. And when the teams fractured and went, you know, somebody went down the street to hawk wares or, uh, you know, sell a restaurant opening, the teams would be divided. So you'd have to split your cameras assigned to that team even further. Very often it was one or two cameras, two cameras if you were lucky. And uh, as editors, we found it very difficult because um, the field producers for the most part were not directors. Um, some had uh, a keener sense, a, a nose for news than others, um, but none of them were assertive enough to direct the camera. And many of the camera crew, remember, you try pulling together 15 cameramen or women and all that gear uh, for a week straight, it's hard to go that deep in an, in an environment. This was mostly New York. Um, uh, and uh, so, yeah, there's a deep pool of camera talent, but not necessarily in cinema verite. Um, 
reality show. This was uh, 2003 was the first year. So the, the round rules were set. Um, they had learned a lot from producing Survivor and Eco Challenge, although Survivor was much more structured. I think there was a competition and uh, a, a final task and that was it. The rest of it was all, you know, let's get together to see who wants to fuck their buddy um, and not romantically either. And uh, there was a lot of that on The Apprentice and that's that pivotal scene before the boardroom that uh, tend to cast a shadow uh, far into the future. So um, the camera work was uh, very hit or miss. And there was one editor who kept a chart in his room. All the cameras, by the way, were labeled with a, a code letter. And uh, we knew who the operators were. And one of the editors had a chart <laughs> next to his avid where every ridiculous camera gaffe he found, he score <laughs> so he could keep track on what camera operators were screwing up. I wish they'd done that uh, for the sound as well because the sound was particularly bad. Um, granted, it was on the fly and uh, they had to keep the mics out of there. Very rarely did they use radio mics, um, but sometimes they did. But still, the uh, when you have big scenes with a lot of people, they didn't you know, have a lot of radio mics to go around. Um, I believe Trump and his guest, the, like the head of promotion for Pepsi, you know, during the task, they wore radio mics, but I'm not certain. So we had a lot of sound channels coming into the, uh, the raw footage. Generally, it was uh, 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 groups of eight. Uh, well, you could go to 16 if needed. And that's how you viewed your raw footage to assemble a scene. Very rarely would you get a meaningful uh, string out. Um, for those of you who don't know reality, a string out is basically the essential action that you know is part of the reason the scene was shot. What happened, what's important, throw out the inessential stuff, the stuff that isn't funny, include the stuff that is funny, even if it's non-essential, where's the drama? And um, they'd put that together with more or less skill, usually less skill. Um, the editors quickly learned that we, that the buck stopped at the Avid and we were the ones who had to pull the basic uh, storyline for every scene out of the raw material, which could be anywhere, oh, from an hour and a half to four hours of material on one, two or three cameras for a given scene. Generally, uh, the team of four editors, uh, the first episode that you worked on, by the way, you worked on every fourth episode, um, uh, it would be broken down into everybody would take a scene and rough out that scene. And then we'd see what we had come up with after a review with the story editor and make changes. And we combine all our scenes together for a rough assembly and all four editors plus the story producer and the story assistant producer would sit down in one bay, it's very cramped, and, uh, and see each other's work and see where the pulse of the show was, who were the culprits. Uh, another very important aspect, so that was a lot of collegiality and that's where I felt I learned the most from my, my fellow editors. There was a wide degree of, of skill and experience um, among the editors and it was great because you got people, some were music video guys and, and great at the montages and the transitions and uh, some were great editing music and um, some were uh, better storytellers or, or audio editors than others. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff on display every day from, you know, uh, your, your, your three other associates. Um, plus you look, could look at other uh, shows. We often looked at the, the material from other shows, especially for the aerial shots for The Apprentice. Um, a lot of money was spent on this gorgeous helicopter photography um, of Manhattan. And I, I still believe it should be a, 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 a stock footage library. Amazing, beautiful choreographed footage. And they used, I believe the same team that they took on the Eco Challenge uh, shows in Borneo and, and Tahiti and other exotic locales where they had this gorgeous tropical scenery. And they were already skilled at doing literally a ballet um, with the helicopter and the camera. Uh, they talked to each other on headsets and they'd arrange moves, combined camera and chopper moves coming over a hill to, to reveal the hikers, for an example. And the work was just gorgeous and day and night and Manhattan at night, of course, is Candyland. And uh, uh, some people would put together more interesting and exciting footage. You rarely had to repeat any of that, um, although there was so much of it and it was used so successfully 
to create the glamour. Remember, the city of New York was a, a character in the show as well. And it was also a show, uh, the show was a platform for Trump properties. Uh, a, a radio comedian in LA said the show had become a infomercial for Trump properties in subsequent seasons. Uh, so uh, there was that, um, there was a, a whole drive filled with uh, aerials day and night. Also when they went on location in the New York area to a Trump golf course, to, to some other uh, locale, there'd be a lot of coverage of that. So you, you had the benefit of a feature film, B-roll, uh, you know, second unit work, and there was second unit uh, beyond the, the uh, helicopter, um, instead of just a documentary where you better get it while you're there because you'll never be back again. So there was lots of support uh, um, in that respect from uh, establishing shots and uh, aerial work. Um, but the interesting, most interesting editorial thing about the show is that um, uh, after the first episode, well, uh, our, our, we started to edit three weeks after Principal began. So we knew um, the first three people who were fired from the show. And the show was determined by reverse engineering every episode, starting with the boardroom. You knew who'd be thrown out. And therefore, you had to rig the coverage of the tasks to prove their success or failure that week to give them grounds of being brought up for being fired. Um, so that's really helpful because you knew who the, um, uh, the loser and the survivor would be that week. The problem is, that when you're editing week three or four or five, they haven't even shot week 13, 14, or 15. So you don't know who the eventual winner is. And you also don't know who the eight final finalists are. The, most likely the people get brought back to help the final two with their own tasks. So you're kind of running blind because you don't know who to set up for future uh, falls. You don't know who to give a, give a reputation to. So the show is constantly evolving. Um, the other interesting thing about it, uh, the, when, I, when I say constantly evolving, I mean, you never know who to curse and who to boost up, you know, who would improve on the show, where alliances would be formed, how do you create uh, disharmony to plan for future blowups. Um, it was very difficult. Um, fortunately, we were given eight weeks to assemble the first cut of the first two shows, the first season. And that's with four editors working on 42 minutes. So that was very generous. Um, so it could be done. Um, they gradually shortened the amount of time that we had to assemble, you know, to assemble the first show for the senior producer on the show, Jay Beanstalk. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll tell you more about that later, but um, it, it, was, it was a moving target all the time. I, I used to say we'd all move forward, not knowing where we're going, but we'd move forward together, creeping up on what shape the show would eventually take. And it was such a group effort. It's kind of cool to watch it coalesce. Uh, right. And, uh, um, but that was something that you don't normally get um, in even a, 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 you know, this was a, a network show at the time when they, you know, it was uh, the time of uh, Survivor, which was getting 24 million viewers in for its finale. I think the best uh, the apprentice got like 22 million in its finale and it was a strong strong show its first year and began a decline since then um uh, i mean since the first uh season each season got less and less um uh, maybe i should allow questions from you gordon or from some, some of your can people I, it's there's so much to talk about after four seasons you know can I ask as an, and if you don't want to answer this, I understand, but how did you feel when Trump got elected? Like having seen all the footage and, and worked, worked on the well, show? I didn't see all the footage, but you saw enough. Uh, most of us knew the first season, he was a real jerk. We, every, every boardroom, he never came to the boardroom prepared. He never knew who anybody was, what the task really was about, what happened. He'd often have his sides with these, the story producers and the showrunners in a separate room off the boardroom, which was a set, by the way. There were like nine cameras in the boardroom. So they had holes in the wall and all kinds of rig things um, and, and set mics. Um, he had no interest in any detail. 
or any anything procedural or anything character. He said, tell me what my choices are. You know, it's just like he ran his cabinet. Yeah. So we all knew what the rest of the country knows now about the man. Um, he's not the kind of leader you'd ever want to work for. Whimsical, flippant, uh, not logical. I'll tell you some examples of boardroom snafus. Um, in th there was a guy named Troy. He was a mortgage broker and he was Kwame's buddy on that show. And it was, it was almost like, you know, the Lone Ranger in Tonto. Um, it was clear that Troy wasn't going to make it to the end. Kwame was this Harvard MBA, good looking, well spoken, and everybody loved Kwame. He was a really decent man and, and um, perhaps too honest and uh, uh, moral to do anything wrong, which meant <laughs> he, uh, he would fail on Survivor. Um, but um, Troy eventually made it to the boardroom, maybe episode five, six, seven, somewhere around there. And Troy got fired. And of course, Trump has to give a reason why I'm firing you after they squabble in the boardroom. And he said, Troy, you're fired because I have fancy dinner parties at my home all the time with educated people. And you're just not educated enough to fit in as though Trump was. Well, you have to, he wasn't thinking of the audience of 17 million people who heard that, more than half of whom hadn't gone to college themselves. So he's insulting his fan base. We, we know it worked in his campaign and in his presidency, but uh, on television, it was shitty. Too. And we, 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 uh, we all knew that. So the search came down to, gee, how do we replace this line? And the best the producers came up with, Troy, you're a loose cannon and I can't risk having you shoot your mouth off in front of my clients and potential uh, customers. Yeah. They didn't have it on camera. You don't bring Trump back for a pickup. The, the, the emperor doesn't do that. So they, they had him loop the line. You know, uh, I think they had to go to his office to get the line. And then they had to put it in uh, off camera on Troy's face or on the back of Trump's head, whatever. And that's how they had to correct that. So that was a strategic marketing mistake that um, uh, he was the loose cannon, right? In that <laughs> instance, it's so funny. Um, he always projects. Yeah, well, sure. Uh, watch what he's accusing the other side of doing. And then it's exactly what he's doing. There's no secret <laughs> to his corruption. Just look look at uh, the, uh, it's, it's the uh, pot calling the kettle black. Yeah. Um, so that's one example. Uh, there was one other. Um, he did say, by the way, if you want to get into it, the, uh, the, by the way, in the uh, American Cinema Editor magazine, there's a, a, a decent write-up of the series after Trump was nominated. And I was one of the editors interviewed. There were several others. And uh, uh, to show you how this got out of hand, when the, the news organizations called, the networks, uh, uh, CNN um, called, the first question out of their mouth was, do you know where the tapes are? Did you ever hear him say, you know, would you fuck her? Well, this came from the ACE magazine article. And uh, in the interview, uh, Bill Pruitt, a senior producer on the show, very nice guy and skilled, uh, he, he reported that in a sidebar meeting uh, regarding one of the female people up to be fired, he asked, would you fuck her? And of course, they all wanted evidence of that mm -hmm. on tape. Of course, it didn't happen on camera. There were no, they did not get covered in these sidebar meetings that they had. But um, it was uh, uh, well covered at the time. You can look it up, American Cinema Editor. And we all shared what we knew. And, and I was asked that and I said, I never saw any sign of abuse or harassment. Um, Bill Pruitt or somebody on the camera crew said, yeah, he was always, you know, he was always flirting with the female camera assistant and the, the rest of the crew would rib her that Donald's sweet for you. Um, I, don't, I think the show made him more brazen. The show certainly made him, oh, I'll give you an, another example. Um, in an early episode in scene one, uh, series, uh, was it season one or two? Um, it was a show that I, I worked on and it was uh, the senior marketing executive was brought on the show to deliver the task to the teams. And there were other people on the stage or wherever they were. And Trump pulled the guy by his shirt sleeve over a couple of inches because Trump knew the guy was not in a good camera spot. So Trump was very savvy to where the cameras were early on in the run of the show. And I thought that was really, you know, it's one of those little things you see as an editor 
that you'd never include, but um, it was but it was also subtle. He didn't make a big gesture of it. So he was aware that he, you know, if the take were used, it should be good. And he, 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 he restaged the scene for appearance's sake. Interesting that you would say that because I talked to um, a camera operator just as he was getting elected. And that's what he said. He said he's extremely media savvy and knows where the light is, knows positions, knows what to do. Um, he just knows. Well, here's something that editors will love. Um, so we were all nervous because we prepared the first two episodes to send to Donald. Not, not seen a frame. And never came around the editing rooms. We were in, in Los Angeles and he was in New York. Um, so the first two cuts go out after being scrubbed over and cleaned up really well. The only comment that came back was that in the boardroom, there was a close up of Donald that was too short. No, wait, there's more to the story. So I said, oh, I got to see this. So I go and I look up the scene because we had, you know, it was on the server. Sure enough, the shot was too short. It was one of those things where, you know, you need a cutaway. So, you know, you use it and they didn't go back and check it somehow. And it was short by 15 frames, maybe. You know, it was just enough to be too short. It was right. And they, they you know, lengthened the shot probably more than 15 frames, but... Um, it was no longer obvious, uh, an obvious blip, but it looked intentional and you got something from him and it was okay to move on from the shot as a result. So uh, it, that, that's in keeping with your cameraman's, camera person's uh, comment that he was very savvy about stuff like that. Of course, he was always looking at himself. Yeah. He didn't care what anybody else looked like. Never said that about any other person. Of course, there were no short shots in the, you know, any show yeah. after that. Um, and I believe he never saw a show until it was finished after that. Wow. Well, why would he waste the time? This time's worth more than 42 minutes, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you'd have to pop a VHS in the deck and have somebody put it on. Um, he, he was really only about the success of the show and how it could spread his fame. Remember, he managed, he didn't own, he managed 25,000 apartments in New York, high-end apartments. And his name was on those properties. And uh, so anything to increase his prestige could increase the selling price or the rental price of the units he managed. Mm -hmm. So it was all about creating an audience for himself in a marketplace. Um, here's another story that I'm sure it's not about editing, but it's about character. Yeah. Uh, in season two, um, it was like the first or the second show. And before the task, Trump is sitting in the uh, limousine with uh, a producer. And uh, there was a camera on the floor of the limo shooting up at Trump. Uh, it was on. He didn't know it. This is not, uh, you know, 47% of Americans are moochers. It wasn't that kind of thing. But it's very telling. So we asked the producer, the showrunner, so uh, uh, how much money did we get from each sponsor last year? Meaning the sponsor of a task. And uh, the producer said, nothing. He said, well, how much are we getting this year? He said, a million dollars. And Donald nodded his approval. That million dollars didn't go to the network. It went to Mark Burnett and Donald Trump. They probably also took a production fee for every episode. They also got two free spots to sell on their own, which I think in the beginning were $285,000 a spot. Plus they had the licensing rights and the show was licensed in 27 countries while it was running. And uh, a funny, if you don't mind, another funny sidebar. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, a Dutch producer had licensed it for Germany and they couldn't find a German uh, empresario or, or a ty tycoon who would want that much exposure. This was a time when German, wealthy Germans were being kidnapped and held for ransom. So they all had too much uh, discretion and a uh, sense of privacy to ever allow themselves to be made a public figure like that. So the Dutch television producer said, well, I'll do it myself. So he became the host. It was, I believe, John DeMaul who uh, created Amazing Race. Well, imagine licensing this show to 27 different countries or regions, the revenue that must've come in on that and who knows what those deals were. So you can see how every episode that was on the air was a huge cash cow for Trump. 
and the ratings almost didn't matter to him because they escalated the payment for the task from one million to two to three to four. They kept getting it even though the ratings were down. And the final ask was five million and they couldn't get it. As I, as I, I wasn't there then, but they, uh, they couldn't get it. And uh, so there was a limit, especially with the shows, that, you know, that's a lot of money. $5 million would buy 20 spots on that show or, you know, five spots on the Super Bowl. What, what that, you know, it's a major chunk of change uh, yeah. for, uh, for uh, you know, you'd say, you could sell it as saying, well, we have a, 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 this is a big audience for a whole hour and your product is gonna be featured in that whole episode, even though it's really not featured beyond the task delivery and, and the final task, uh, the major task. Um, but uh, it was prestigious. And, um, you know, who knows, they got to, it was a promotional device for their own product. Mm -hmm. um, the Diet Pepsi one was such a stupid task. They were releasing um, uh, a new form of Diet Pepsi globally, and the teams had to uh, design a bottle, a 20 ounce bottle for the global market. None of these people had any design training or background. And they did get to work with designers, um, and uh, with more or less success, it was a very fraught show and it was ugly. You know, it was like, they didn't produce any design. You know, not, not that it, it, that's a little unfair. I mean, although they did have professional designers to keep them honest, but it was one of those things where nobody knew what they were doing. It was just an excuse, but the product, Pepsi, Diet Pepsi was, <laughs> you know, at least 11 minutes of the show, it was center stage. So if you look at a, a $5 million or a $2 million investment for that, that's not so bad with, a, with an audience of 14 or 17 million mm -hmm. people. Any, any other questions, Gordon? Well, I have a question coming in from a, uh, someone named Steve, and they want to know um, now that Trump, and again, if you're not comfortable with answering any of these, uh, you don't have to, but they want to know now that Trump's out or going to be out soon, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen to him? Do you think he'll go create his media empire that we've heard about or go back to The Apprentice? Well, I, I think had he lost in 2016, he very much would have formed Trump News. Mm -hmm. I, uh, now there's talk of him uh, joining or buying or merging with Max One, I think, and there's another far right uh, cable network. Uh, it's very possible. Um, uh, he'll continue to preach to his own choir. Uh, we haven't heard the last of him. Those people having come out from under their rocks will not go back easily. They've enjoyed the spotlight too much. It's been too much fun for the white supremacists and the racists. Um, no, that's the problem. We're, we're, this is a scar on our conscience and our, our, on practically how to run the country. Not a, you know, we, we're still in the pandemic crisis that uh, could have been averted. Remember this guy refused to get in the business of providing protective equipment for frontline medical caregivers. And he said, it's not our job to hand out hospital gowns. And any reasonable person would say, no, it's your job to protect the health of the whole country. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so this is the kind of liar he is and prevaricator and uh, selfish man he is. You know, and, and he's lazy. He, you know, and we saw this on the show. I don't want to do the work of providing medical gowns for people risking their lives every day. Why should I? Let the governors do that. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? You know, <laughs> as though they don't have enough to do. So there's no such thing as a national disaster unless it's voter fraud that doesn't exist um, or a uh, consorting with foreign entities to uh, disgrace your, your uh, opponents in an election. That's not a national catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is because it's, it's, it's uh, all fake and uh, a pandemic is not fake. I mean, there's still people who believe it's a hoax. Well, and I heard and this, uh, rumors that he wants to announce his 2024 bid, uh, like run for president on when Joe Biden gets sworn in, <laughs> which wouldn't surprise me given his, his history, well, but. He, he may do that, but um, somebody uh, in the LA Times today had a very perceptive point that Trump was a pop culture phenomenon, even though it wasn't kids who supported him mostly, mm -hmm. but it, pop culture in terms of those easily swayed and, uh, capable of forming a dedicated fan base. And what happens to pop culture fan uh, icons? They fade away. There's another one to replace them. So out of the spotlight, he will not be anywhere near as potent. He will not get the mainstream press coverage. He won't get Fox News coverage as well, especially if he forms his own news network. Yeah. 
So yes, he's going to be around. You'll have Mitch McConnell there to carry on the toxic torch uh, and others, uh, uh, the California uh, House uh, Minority Leader uh, is just an awful nasty guy. Watch out for him uh, in 2024. Uh, there's lots of really slimy people uh, uh, trying to fill his role. Um, he may run. He may run as a third party candidate. We've seen he has enough ego to do that. Um, what this man will attempt to do is limitless. So I don't think anything will surprise anybody anymore. And, and in a way, that's why he's lost his potential to surprise. And he's lost his allure as a pop culture uh, lightning rod. You know, plus um, every year. I'm sorry to say some of those older, white, senior, angry, bitter, unemployed, uneducated, and educated people will die off. The Republican Party is still declining in its members, like the NRA is losing members. It's on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, so it, it, we're looking at a generational shift, and it may take another generation or two to purge ourselves of this arch severe element. But believe me, you know, uh, th this, this is an element of human nature to hate, to otherize other people, especially if they look differently than you. This is a basic human flaw that's always gonna be with us. So it, it's not like when Trump goes, we'll be okay, or in two generations, there'll be no racism or no discrimination um, if we're still around with the climate challenge. Uh, it, it, this is a big lesson on how we have to be on guard for people who don't tell the truth, we have to insist upon facts, not your own version of them, and uh, uh, to be aware of. So it, it, it's up to us to learn the lesson really well and to take steps, even with the Supreme Court, which is turning out to be uh, uh, less conservative, although they're still very conservative. Um, the, their handling of these uh, election claims, uh, Trump has had his wrist slapped and he's been all his suits have been tossed out and they're, they're going nowhere. Um, and it makes him look like the, the suits are the last gasp of a, a dying monster. You know, the flames going out and all you hear is the empty wind um, because uh, the deep state is really these decent people in government who are watchdogs and whistleblowers and who won't let him ride roughshod over people. Fauci is one. Um, there are many others. He's just, you know, very popular. Um, and there are a few people turning away from Trump as well. So we have to be on guard, you know, and uh, be more informed. Um, I have a, a question here from someone. They want to jump back to, because you were on The Apprentice when Mark, as it was developing and figuring out its path. Yeah. Um, and Mark Burnett really pioneered a lot of things in uh, reality television. So what was it like working with the story producers and Mark Burnett to figure out that structure for the, the show? Um, Mark, I, I have to credit Jay Beanstalk and his team of story producers with help helping beat the show into shape, along with the editors who provided really great scene work. Um, remember, the scenes were built as pods and were somewhat movable within a show, but the show was still formatted, task delivery, planning, a, 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 an experimental task, executing it, a reward, uh, then planning and executing the main task, uh, then the, uh, the decompression scene before the boardroom. Oh, the task winner, and then the blame casting, and then the boardroom. So there you know, wasn't that much leeway where you could put a scene, but within uh, uh, a segment between commercials, there was some leeway. Um, but uh, Jay had been a showrunner on Survivor. So he, you know, um, he and Craig Pelegian were the two final showrunners. Craig finally left to start his own company um, and did a casino show, which uh, I think either he did the first casino show or Trump did. They went to Vegas and they did a reality show at a casino and both of them bombed. Um, but uh, these were very well honed uh, story producers uh, at the top. I'm not saying every story producer was experienced, but um, they were the ones who really shaped it. And they, we editing teams went through a lot of reiterations and changes, revisions, taking notes, not even from network people, but from our own internal producers before uh, Mark could see it. And Mark was very keen. You know, I, I, I'd been to his home and shown him cuts with his kids <laughs> at night. And uh, 
uh, I'm not sure everybody did that. I was just, it's just the luck of the draw that that night he had to watch watch babysit for his kids. Um, and uh, he was astute, you know, um, he was very cautious, very market savvy and, you know, image conscious, not for himself necessarily, but spinning the show, you know, he is a great marketing talent, not a filmmaking talent. And uh, uh, the choices they made were very conservative in terms of appeal, you know, lowest com common denominator, what jokes to play, what not, um, how do you, far do you push something, make it exciting, cut it fast, you know, um, it, it was a very quickly cut show, very brisk pace, um, nothing lagged. Music was very assertively edited and uh, bombastic usually to ramp, it. even the cooking shows, I watch Chopped a lot because it's on at our house and you watch the music editing on Chopped and it's you know, 15, 20 seconds and you're onto another cue. We, we'd often have uh, more than 28 cues in 42 minutes. I mean, there'd be some scenes without it. And uh, you know, they're all the, the reverse symbol crashes and things that people like to use. I didn't because I found it was an intrusion and pointed to the artifice of the show. If you, your scene is really well cut, dramatically cut and it has a purpose and you proved its weight, it should prove it raw without music and the music should just accentuate it. So you don't need the fringe. Why, why take the audience farther away from the characters and what's said or done? So music is this overlay, which can be so wonderfully supportive. At the same time, um, it can be fake and make the whole show seem fake because you're, you're boosting a reaction with that reverse symbol, for example, yeah. uh, that, um, that isn't as convincing as it needs to be, but that's the best one you have. So they say, oh, that's weak. Let's put a symbol crash on it. And what do you have? You have, you know, garbage over garbage, you know? And uh, it, it, they didn't see it that way I did. Um, and uh, there was one editor in particular, he was a team leader and he would overscore scenes with overly dramatic music, big music and, you know, the emotions in the music were bigger than the emotions in the scene. <laughs> and I, they loved it because it was big music. I, I yeah. just, you know, I didn't work that way. And um, uh, <laughs> I think that's all he did. His team accused him of doing the least work of anybody on the team. <laughs> Often they, by the way, I have to say for the editors that um, the, the lead editor was the one who inherited the cut usually after it went to network. Because after Mark saw it, it went to the network and there might be a change or two for the network. And then the team leader would eventually take over and do all the revisions. He'd be the, called the finishing editor. Mm -hmm. Change any music they didn't like, change pace, uh, add some effects, change transitions, change shots, uh, whatever it took, uh, add effects you know, to make it play better. And that was often done with only a day or two because oh. the, the online was, laborious, the sound work was pretty good, uh, the post sound, um, the product field sound was not good, so they had to make up for that. Um, and, uh, you know, it got, uh, I think they spent, I think they spent one day per mix, per, per episode, wow. which on a show that complicated, eh, it's not really enough to do a great job. Um, uh, usually no editor saw or attended the mix, no story producer did, it was a post supervisor. And not knowing the show as well as we did, there'd be lines dropped that they forgot to put in the mix. You know, they were there, but didn't get mixed in. That happened to me once. It was a, an act out with a surfing show and uh, uh, a surfing champ named Sonny um, uh, was talking about something on the show that was killing him. And we put that over him riding an enormous wave and music up and act out. And they, they dropped the line, it's killing me. So it was just him on a wave. He just hung there. So, you know, okay, you, you can build in to your edited scene, all the sound design you think you can and cut the music the way it should be. But because you're handing off the episode to somebody else to finish, there, there can be problems. Granted, it was not worth shaking. It did not hurt the ratings of the show. But when you're into editing and, and it's there, it just makes it better. So it's mm -hmm. painful to see an editor's efforts wasted. And I'm sure your audience, Gordon, you know, knows exactly what I'm talking about. Whether it's something that gets changed back or something that get, gets submitted, it, it hurts. Yeah. Um, so it's all about you know, how much care you can put into it. And you know, some people really got behind The Apprentice and didn't mind 
um, him or the show. And if you look at that ACE article, there was a woman editor who said, oh, I didn't see any misbehavior. I mean, we were just doing a job and we were, you know, dutifully. And that's why Mark Burnett, when uh, Trump was nominated in 15, 16 rather, he said, um, I created a monster. No, Mark Burnett did not say, we, the team, created a monster. He said, I created a monster. But he, it's okay. he can talk that way because it's his show. And then he was asked, after saying that, when Trump got elected, he was asked to uh, produce the uh, inaugural ball, which he did. Wow. But he couldn't get any name rock group to play. Yeah. <laughs> so they had some second rate, because <laughs> nobody big in Hollywood would want to be connected with him. Yeah. It's hilarious. So he failed the inaugural ball to produce it. But it was okay. He had four years anyway. He had the biggest inaugural turnout, right? Of yeah. anybody. You can cover up stuff like that. Now you've been very generous with your time. I have one last question that I like to ask everyone I interview. Um, what would you say your favorite guilty pleasure film is to watch? Guilty pleasure film? Or show. Um, well, I came out of film. I should say that, that my background, sorry to take longer. Uh, I started out editing as a trailer editor, and this was quite a while ago when trailer editing was the trickiest editing uh, in Hollywood because there was no script. You, it, basically, a trailer was a montage with some dialogue. Occasionally, you'd get narration, but we'd use the dialogue from the movie as a spine. So I was already used to editing without a script, without narration. I'd create my own narrative through line, uh, score my own music usually a temp at first, um, and then you'd replace it with feature music when it became available. Uh, do effects editing, um, and uh, increasingly so, especially now, special effects and titles and titling. Um, so I had those skills, and I had montage skills as well because I had done uh, uh, segments for the uh, Oscars, uh, you know, tribute segments, and, um, and for other award events. I did Screen Actors Guild for two years, and so, you know, I, and, um, I'd done some documentaries as well. So um, I had skills in narrative, I had features. Um, so that scripted narrative, an unscripted documentary, montage, music. So I had all these disparate skills, but never uh, worked on a reality show until 2001 when I got called to do uh, um, a military action show. Uh, and then uh, because a the survivor crew left that show, this was for Burnett. Yeah. Uh, uh, blanking on the title and uh and then on to uh the restaurant and the surfing show which was a fix uh a show had been badly produced and we were called in three producers and three editors were called in to resurrect uh uh three cut shows and three uncut shows uh on a surfing championship called uh boarding house north shore and then the apprentice um your question was What's your favorite guilty pleasure? Guilty show pleasure. So I, I came out of out of features, um, obscure, sensitive movies that probably didn't make a lot of money, like Mickey One with Warren Beatty, and uh, Arthur Penn directed. Um, not not necessarily old films, um, but uh, I, I like uh, dramas. Uh, so I, I, you know, the, I don't have guilty pleasures. I'm <laughs> I have frustrated pleasures because they're so hard to find. I'm kind of a dramatic person, dramatic films. Um, but, uh, you know, a great film was uh, Ron Howard's Parenthood or yeah. It's Complicated. You know, those were commercial pop films, very well done. So, yeah. uh, you know, I don't feel guilty about watching them because they're so good, especially It's Complicated. Yeah. So, uh, you know. Well, thank you so much for letting us interview you. Okay. I hope uh, it uh, filled in some of the blanks about our <laughs> Donald and where yeah. we've been. But, you know, now what many of us on the Apprentice team new back in 2003. Wow, thank you and, so much. Okay, thank you. Good luck to everybody. Yep, Bye. you too. Bye. Bye.